Hi, welcome to Poetry Tutorials. Uh, we're a poetry podcast that fosters the voices of diverse contemporary poets and spoken word artists. Um, I'm Lulu. I'm Tom. Welcome if you're new to the channel. Yeah. Um, podcast. We went in April to uh, the Lyra Festival in Bristol. Uh, it was running for two weeks and we went just for the last weekend. Um, what events did we go to, Tom? The Bristol City of Words, which was a kind of, well, it's kind of like an open mic of like local Bristol talent. It was, it wasn't an open mic, it was like a, a set. So. so they had, yeah, they had uh, the city poets, people who have a job uh, to write poetry for the city. And they had a group that wrote poetry around the city and they read poetry about Bristol. So it was very focused on Bristol. And I felt like the whole festival in general was focused on Bristol. Yeah. And it was um kind of headlined by Cat Lyons, yeah, who's who the Bristol city poet. Mm -hmm, current, yeah. yeah. Current Bristol city poet. And uh, Miles Chambers, Weiss. who was the first ever Bristol city poet. Yeah, it was... The whole festival went on for like two weeks, didn't it? Yeah, it's it was a long festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it yeah. seemed to and be really, really active venues. in the city for Bristol, yeah. uh, you know, residents and artists and poetry lovers. Uh, it's a great scene out there, right? Yeah, I was really impressed with the way poetry is really valued in uh, Bristol and this city poet scheme. I didn't really know about that. I mean, we saw it in Birmingham, but I feel like I could understand more what it entailed which is write poetry for for events uh, by the council, etc. And you left a, a poem of yours on the wall there. I did. There was you an exhibition. A poem. Yeah, so there's an exhibition uh, of S Bristol City of Words, which is the theme of the whole festival, actually. And there was a wall where you could write some poems, and I left a couple of words. It was a bit random, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was really, fun. You really took your time writing that poem as well. Did I? Yeah, <laughs> the little note. Oh. I was filming you, and you're like, "Stop filming." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we had great fun meeting everyone, and um, yeah, we love you, yeah, Bristol. It was cool. <laughs> the second event we went to was on Saturday night, and they headlined Hel Holly McNish, uh, Michael Peterson. Yeah. Like school picture. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we're with Michael Peterson. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Michael yeah. Peterson and Holly McNish. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for talking to us. So we're here at the Lyra Poetry Festival and we've done uh, the event, the kind of, I think, main event of the festival. I don't really Let's know. Let's call it that. We'll go for that. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a yeah, title, <laughs> main event. <laughs> yeah, and you've been touring together, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, do you want to tell us a bit more the experience of touring together? Yeah, I mean, we tour together a lot, but this sort of mini tour has been designed about the release of the paperback version of my book, Boyfriends, which Holly's in and is really involved in and toured with me for the hardback. So it's just been a mini tour. We've been in London, then Hebden Bridge, then Edinburgh, and then down here to Bristol to sort of finish off this tranche of it. Um, but it's been beautiful. They're all like really sort of literary, rich, artistic cities. Um, and it just felt like such a nice, vivacious network to be part of. And this was obviously a great one to finish it off with, you know, five, six hundred people in a stunning looking church. Yeah, it's a beautiful venue, right? <laughs> yeah, we were marvelling yeah. at it outside for about five minutes before we yeah, even came yeah, 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 in. Yeah. I think I think we were nearly late for the sound checks because <laughs> we were in such awe of the exterior of the building. Yeah. <laughs> and you're touring for Slug. Yes, I'm touring for Slug. Just I sort of just normally do a couple of days a week touring, so I never do like a big kind of two weeks or three weeks. Just from, just from being a parent, basically. So I've sort of slowly been touring it over a year and a half. <laughs> yeah, so it's a slow process. But I've got a new book coming out next year, so then I'll change up the tour then. But yeah, there's a few more, few more dates left that we're doing together, some, some apart as well. But yeah, about a year, a year left of touring Slug. Although I don't, I don't just stop reading poems from it. If a new book comes out, I'll just keep. Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, what's the new book? Uh, so it's called Lobster, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. what kind of new poetry does it have compared to Slug? So it's all it's, it's about the same size as Slugger, and then it's just got different themes. So there's a lot of poems about friendship, which there wasn't in Slug so much. Um, there's, a, there's a whole section on oral sex in uh, Lobster, <laughs> <laughs> very specific <laughs> sexual section. <laughs> there's, um, there's a section on it called Motherland, which is all about sort of nationality and having parents from a different country than the country that you grow up in. Um, yeah, just, lo just lots of different things. So it's all different topics, seven topics again, but di just different topics to slug and prose and poetry. Yeah. Yeah. And I was interested in learning how your writing both complements each other and how you figure that out during the touring. Uh, because maybe your poetry has been defined a bit more towards the filthy part of it. I like that, yeah. 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 So, sometimes I think that I'm the cleaner out of the two. So if I can get in on, if I can get a monopoly on filth whilst yeah. touring alongside Holly McNish, then that means I'm coming right in at the top yeah. of the filthy game. We, we talked to people during the, the, you know, the break, and they were like, I like that poo poem. I'm so that it, I have seen that poem described as a constipation epic okay. in one of the reviews as well. So yeah, just getting right into all of those, you know, humiliating experiences which strip you to the bone at those ages but now you can reclaim them years after knowing you survived them knowing you surpassed them you can see the humor in it you can yeah. find the humility in yourself that you maybe didn't have at that point in time so just to reclaim them on those terms sort of empowers you from that per perspective but yeah of course the filthier the better because yeah. the, the filthier it was the more humiliating it was at the time <laughs> yeah. i have to say it was a very funny poetry night oh good Good. Yeah, a lot of laughs. <laughs> yeah, you're conscious of it. I mean, you don't shy away from the sort of harder hitting, sentimental, emotional content, but you want it to be a night out as well. Like both of us love the live, vivacious experience of going to a literary event. We want these to be going head to head with band nights or club nights. We want people's you know, stomachs to hurt from laughing when they leave, but also to be full of all of that sort of good emotional juju at the same time. Definitely, and uh, yeah, I really liked the piece about uh, your friend. Yeah. yeah, just yeah. there's a lot of friendship poems actually. Yeah, the whole night actually. The, yeah. I like I had lots of friendship poems as well, but it's lovely. Like it's such a big thing that people don't talk about enough. I don't think there's so much love poetry. I guess to romantic lovers or. or Married partners who, who should also be romantic lovers, but aren't <laughs> aren't always. Um, <laughs> I've heard from people, um, but yeah, I don't think there's enough about friendship really, and and I, I like that there's more and more coming out. I guess there's less people are getting married, less people are kind of settling down. You don't have to. There's more people in later life getting divorced as well. There's much more people. I think the world's kind of opening up to the importance of of friendship a little bit more. There seems to be more and more poetry about it. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice to celebrate friendship. I like it. I really, really like talking about my friends. <laughs> So many different versions of ourselves which correlate with all of the different friends that we sort of circle around us uh, and it's so commonly pushed to the periphery compared to you know a long-term family making marriage style relationship but you know it's our friends arms will fall into through these heartbreaks through these occasions and will make love and lose more friends than any other category of human relationships so how important to continue to celebrate them and celebrate all of the different versions of ourself we are in these relationships and not to shy away from them being called romantic at the same time for them to be full of love. Also silly, also smutty, also filthy, but full of love as well. Yeah, yeah it inspires me because that's what I'm writing about currently. Because oh, okay. uh, Yeah, I'm a poet as well and I'm writing about more like the heartbreak part of friendships yeah. Yeah. Which is but <laughs> just as hard as other relationship yeah, 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 yeah. It, we don't have as much guidance no. on it no, and no. so it's harder and it's not to taken return. seriously i don't think yeah, yeah, yeah. if you get heartbroken over friendship it's not seen as such a thing or i guess like with hospital visits quite often it's sort of like you know family or partners can come mm. as if friendship isn't yeah, it's, it's fascinating actually the way we've got these hierarchies of relationships that's yeah. nice that's nice that you're yeah. writing about that I don't. Good flag. 
<laughs> yeah. That, as you say, like you lose a dear friend. I mean, they knew you just as integrally as 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 a lover did from that perspective. In some in some ranges, they often knew a more complete part of you that you might have tried to sculpt differently in that romantic relationship. So of course, we feel broken up with. We feel heartbroken about these things, and we have to understand how we exist in their absence. Who do we become? And with this cataclysmic loss in our lives in that perspective. And hopefully we can find a humor in that, but that takes time and it takes understanding and it takes analyzing it from that perspective. We have to sort of prod at it until we can giggle at it. Yeah, definitely. I had a, a question for you, Holly, because you just got the French translation yeah, yeah, yeah. of Slug Out and I'm French, so oh, I got nice. interested in that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I saw uh, a tweet that you put once, which was the correct translation of fingering. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sure more of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I guess my question was, how was the process of translating it to French? Because you were, oh, I don't know if you still do, uh, a French teacher. So yeah. you've been involved in the translation. Yeah, so not like my French is not in any way good enough to do the actual translation and the translators, Valérie Rousseau was the main main translator, there were two, um, but they were in really incredible. It was just with the poems I wanted to have a say in certain things that translators, that it's impossible to know if a poet puts for certain lines that I really wanted to rhyme or I thought the poem didn't work if they didn't rhyme or if the rhythm didn't sound a certain way. I would prefer to totally change the vocabulary and to keep the rhyme than have it as a direct translation. But they, they were great. Like the editors let me look through everything. Translators were amazing. Um, just, but just with the poems, not really with the, the prose. The prose I left to them. I'm so excited about that. I think I'm, I'm more excited about the translations than nearly anything else with my work. I'm really, yeah, because I, I like studied French and German at uni and I was uh, it's what I've been most interested in is like trying to learn other languages and the French it's just fascinating seeing somebody translate your ideas and there was quite the, the sexual stuff in the book was by far the, the thing that there was most problems translating things like dogging <laughs> the word doesn't exist in French <laughs> yeah I just got I learned so about funny. that word then. yeah yeah it was so funny and then I'd have these conversations with the editor and the editor was like tea, tea bagging is another yeah. one which does not have a French word. and then so what's and that <laughs> So, uh, tea bagging <laughs> is when you have someone's testicles in your mouth. So d okay. they dip their testicles into your mouth, basically like t a tea bag. Yeah. It's a very English sexual phrase. I've realised yeah, because of the tea. Of the tea. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, the, but describing that to an editor because it was translated as yeah. sort of like it, it did. It just wasn't translated as what it actually is. And then I was saying to the editor, "Oh, actually, so this translation." Mm, and then he was like, "Okay, so what does this mean?" And then it was so embarrassing even though i'd written it i was like uh well this is uh the description of testicles being lowered into someone's mouth he was like oh yeah we don't have a word for that in french <laughs> and I was like, that makes for interesting emails so. yeah exactly it was really funny so i've got my first like um bilingual gig in june in just on the outskirts of paris to do 10 minutes in english and 10 minutes in french it's like a bilingual theater company and then hopefully be doing the poems in French in September and sort of late September. But I'm so excited because I've really, I've had books I've translated before and I wasn't sure about the translations of the poems, but these ones, it's been great being able to work on them. So all the ones that I think is important to rhyme, they all rhyme. The ones that are important to keep the certain images, they have them and the ones where the vocabulary is important, it's like that. And it will just be funny reading out the the sexual stuff that you realise Britain's just full of weirdos compared to France. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just their shock, like, D what does talking mean? It's what? And you're like, well, <laughs> is this, I mean, it must exist in France, but just not. I'm sure we have other concepts that must be weird. Yeah, be great, so I would love to know the different ones that we don't have that you have. <laughs> yeah. It's important on that cultural difference. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I love it. And the swearing is quite hard to translate. I love that, that the stuff in language that's hardest to translate is sort of the filthiest stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's great. Not yeah. saying dogging's filthy. I just mean like, you know, what we deem filthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess on that conversation about language and culture, mm-hmm. how do you think your Scottish heritage shows up in your poetry and to maybe an English audience? Yeah, so it's sort of mm, unavoidable. I've been described as Scottish as fuck. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that was meant in a complimentary fashion, but yeah. But there's so much interest uh, there in terms of the vernacular, in terms of the history of it all, whether it's like a contemporary use of the Scottish language. Um, but I do in a lot of international shows, and I understand that to an international audience, Scottish vernacular is not the friendliest to whistle into their ears. So. I've became quite adept, I hope, at sort of thinking a few words ahead uh, and questioning what the translation of that is or taking the Scots out of it. I definitely have an international poetry voice and international versions of some of the poems. But even that's just infinitely fascinating to think about whether this is a local metaphor or whether it's an international metaphor and how do I quickly change that into an international metaphor on the spot because... I love reading uh, internationally. We do quite a lot of it together. We do a lot of it separately. Um, And the more places I can go with the poetry, I'm fortunate enough to go to the better. So I'm very conscious of that. But I also want to celebrate the Scottish language at the same time, but in a way that offers people in. You know, you don't want to build any boundaries. And sometimes the sound of the words, the onomatopoeic nature of it, or a, a word used very deftly within a stanza or a sentence can define itself or can at least send somebody guessing in the right direction. Yeah. <laughs> We're with uh, Malaika Kagodi. You're the poet, you're the festival poet at Lyra Poetry Festival. Um, do you want to tell us a bit more about how that worked out to become the festival poet? Yeah, of course. Um, So I've been based in Bristol for almost 10 years now. I moved here in 2014. And uh, Danny, who's the festival director, and I kind of started out in the poetry world at the same time. Um, He started a night called Raise the Bar. I started a night called Milk Poetry. So we've always kind of um, been in each other's worlds. And then over time, we both kind of become more enveloped into the poetry world in Bristol. And yeah, because he started Lyra, uh, he got in touch with me to say like you've been doing really cool things in the city would you like to be the festival poet so I stepped into that role and it's been yeah really lush and nice so what do you do as the festival poet so I have been um, curating the archive of poetry that's happening at the moment at the uh, Bristol Beacon so there's a room full of poems about Bristol and written by people who are based in Bristol Uh, so it's like lots of Bristol voices to carry the city of words theme through Um, I'm also doing a workshop, a two-hour workshop on Sunday um, about writing about the city and finding home in an unfamiliar place. I judged the slam, uh, which is incredible, lots of like new voices from the city and also just from the southwest in general. Uh, And I also performed um, tonight with Holly McNish and Michael Peterson, so it was nice. Yeah, and your performance was just incredible, it really moved me. So a lot of your poetry is about bodies, right? I mean, your set was, I don't know if all of your poetry is about bodies, but your last pamphlet as well is. And I had a question I was wondering, so you said that you had an injury and that made you more self-conscious about your body. I was wondering what your relationship with your body was before that injury. Mm. I think I just did everything I could to be, to ignore my body and just be like, oh yeah, it's just kind of pulling me through life. And when I had that injury, I like really badly damaged my back, basically like um, during a performance as well, mm. which kind of made it even more kind of jarring because if you injure yourself during a performance, you just carry on. And so you're kind of <laughs> working that injury in. Yeah. And it's not until like the endorphins have died down that you're like, oh no, I've really done some damage here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, beforehand, I think I was just trying to ignore my body and be like, oh yeah, it's just doing its thing. But then building that strength back up Uh, made me just appreciate it so much more and I think if you've had a really unhealthy body that's damaged and injured um, you really appreciate when the the work that goes into making it well again uh, just makes you kind of embrace that so much more. Yeah and uh, we're from Brighton and we've heard of milk poetry before Mm. Um, and it's funny that you say you've been here for 10 years or so and you're 
really contribute to the poetry community. So I wanted to know a little bit your history of poetry in Bristol. Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, I actually grew up in Devon. And when I was growing up in Devon, there wasn't much poetry. And also it was the time that it was, I kind of started getting into it before it had had this wave of becoming as popular as it is, popular enough to like sell out St. George in Bristol, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, I had been doing open mics and things like that in, uh, in Devon as much as I could. Then when I moved to Bristol in 2014, uh, me and my friend Graham, Graham Chilcott, who is a, a great poet and just like brilliant human being, uh, we started Milk Poetry together because we were going to lots of open mics and slams. And we kind of came at this weird time where lots of nights were finishing. I think like the scene was just moving on, lots of people leaving Bristol. And we managed to swoop in to uh, a place that had previously had a slam and an open mic. Um, and we're like finishing up their run and we were like oh well we can do something here and yeah so we started milk poetry really quite early to my move into Bristol and then from then just kind of carried on going like I really love uh, helping other people kind of reach their potential and, and get to a place where they feel really comfortable in their artistic endeavors so that's been a huge part of my journey into poetry and you do a bit of that you do a bit of performing do some open mics you just like patchwork together all the things that you really yeah. love and then eventually if you're really lucky people will start inviting you to things and and paying you money and like fortunately that happened with me and it's um yeah it's a really gorgeous thing I never expected it to be as big a part of my life as it's become so I feel very lucky um yeah it's nice yeah it kind of stop boy pump poetry because mm. we I don't think we grew up thinking of poetry as a serious thing to do it, so opportunities kind of just come up right and I was wondering what, what your experience was of judging the slam. Uh, so the winner for information is Emma Taylor. Um, yeah, how did you yeah. pick her? <laughs> it's so hard because everybody's so different. You can tell everyone's bringing their heart into it in so many different ways, different experiences kind of fuse into it all. So I hate having to actually like write the number down to be like, okay, how I can like pick this apart. <laughs> like, um, but mostly it's just incredible because all the all the slammers are like supportive of each other and they bounce off each other like before the show and in the interval and afterwards. And I think that's the thing to remember when you're like judging a slam is that, and also when you're taking part in a slam, is that you're all in there together. Like, we're like poets, that's ridiculous, right? So, <laughs> so let's embrace that ridiculousness and like, and all the beauty that can bring and all the silliness that can bring. Um, yeah, it's just a, a real honor to watch lots of people pour their heart out to us on a stage especially when they're near the beginning of their journeys you know because that's before anyone's jaded and is kind of making things because they feel like they should that's yeah. that's the poems that like are their heart poems and they're they're giving th them to us so yeah I did I did love it although I was like oh no I don't want to score them they're great <laughs> any other final words to our audience who maybe is discovering the poetry scene in Bristol yeah I mean it's a brilliant scene. It's a very generous, lovely scene. Um, if you're Bristol-based and you want to perform, come to Milk Poetry. Like, it's a very warm embrace. Um, and, yeah, just keep writing always, whether you share it or not. Like, it's a gorgeous thing to do. Uh, yeah, enjoy enjoy the words. Love them always. Yeah, thank you so much, Malika. It was lovely talking to you. <laughs> So we're with uh, Cat Lyons at the Lyra Poetry Festival. Cat Lyons, you're the current uh, Bristol city poet. Yeah. Um, how's that? How's that going? It's going well. It's um, it's a bit of a responsibility because you know I'm telling the story for a whole city, not just for me. And it's getting used to doing lots of commission work, which is totally different from writing for yourself. You're writing for other people, um, but it's it's really good and it's. It's really lovely to see how poetry connects to people's stories across sort of lines of, like, of difference no matter who people are. They're finding something to like to see themselves in and it's great. And Lyra Fest is brilliant. I'm getting to go out and being Bristol City Poet means I like, sometimes getting to gigs for free, which is nice. <laughs> so I get poetry gigs for free. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Were well, you part of Lyra Fest before? Yeah, I was um, I was the first Lyra Poetry Fest Slam champion. Oh wow! So yeah, so it's nice to. Th and this year I was one of the judges in the sort of um, 
the preliminary rounds. So I got to see it from the other side. And I'm very glad I'm not one of the people that was being judged because it is so stressful when you're doing it. Um, but yeah, they're all amazing. It's just so lovely to see people like really putting the heart and soul into poetry and like telling all their stories and get it out there. So bloody talented. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's coming full circle for you then, yeah, doing the champ and now like, judging. Yeah, I was, I was like, <laughs> inspiring slam, slam person, and now I, and then I was a slam winner, and now I'm like, I was just at um, the City of Words event yesterday with um, like the pre, the first Bristol City poet, Miles Chamberlain, and and it was just really great to be part of it and feel like, you know. Bristol supported my poetry journey and sort of be giving that back as well. Yeah. So it's really nice. Yeah, you've got a show running as well in in, uh, in Bristol, like a spoken word show about menopause, right? It's just finished actually. It's the the UK tour has just come to an end a couple of weeks ago. So I was touring that for the last year, um, and now I've run out of arts council funding. So unless anybody wants to pay me lots of money, hint, 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 to like <laughs> to support me re-rehearsing and paying myself and paying technicians, then it's probably not going to be performed in the same way again. But there's parts of it which stand alone as pieces of work. So bits of it will come out in different ways, but the the project, the show has sort of wrapped itself up and I get to write about something else. Yeah, something I was interested in is you're non-binary, right? Yeah. And you wrote that show when you were a cis woman yeah. or identified as a cis woman. Yeah. How's that now touring? That? Well, yeah, one of the reasons that I'm not going to be touring it anymore is because the place that I was in when I wrote it isn't the place that I am now. Basically, you... Uh, you can only describe your experiences with the words that are available to you at the time. Um, and I didn't have those words to describe my gender experience until I started, um, until I was in my late 30s and sort of took the time to sit with myself and my body and my experiences and how I related to it, which is what the experience of being pushed into premature menopause sort of made me do. And I might not have, I might not have taken that time had I not had that experience. And I would just always have been that, I kind of describe it when people ask me to describe it, like like I had a bit, like a stone in my shoe. And I could still walk, but God, it's so much nicer now I've taken the stone out. I'm like, oh yeah. I'm just skipping about, you know, <laughs> and yeah. probably, you know, and I would have kept on, you know, kind of being like kind of uncomfortable walking around for like years had I not taken that stone out, but it would never have been really comfortable and I, and I probably wouldn't have realized why and, and now I know. And so it's, yeah, so one of the reasons that, yeah, the show was written during the process of me sort of re-evaluating my relationship to myself, my gender and my body, my biology. But then once I finished writing it, it felt wrong to go back and change it all and rewrite all the pronouns that, I'm u- that I used. And, and the, of course, the experience of menopause is one experienced primarily by cis women. So it it's feels fine to like leave it as it is um, as long as, you know, I'm also acknowledging that that's not the place I am now. And when I perform it, I perform it as me then. So it's not, it's not fake. It's, it's just that I am performing myself from sort of four years ago um, in an experience that was pretty horrible and traumatic. Um, but I perform it not from that space now. Um, and in, because of all those reasons, it's kind of time to let a show sit with where it is and then maybe step back from it yeah that gives you extra distance to perform it differently yeah totally yeah it's better because i have more distance but there's a level of distance past which it feels maybe inauthentic to perform it still Mm -hmm. and it also is a really important conversation to have but i've been having that conversation now for four years and as a writer i want to give myself space to write about other things so 
yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got to write a whole new show now. <laughs> and a whole new funding bit. <laughs> yeah, on top of being the, the city poet. Yeah. yeah. And, and having a day job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and any words for audience who maybe is discovering um, the, the poetry scene in Bristol and how the scene is here? Oh, if I mean, oh God, sorry, I was totally ignoring you, just chatting to... Um, if you're a poet and you're just discovering poetry and you want to write, then just keep on writing. Keep on writing and keep on reading and keep on going to gigs if you can. But if you can't afford to keep going to gigs, because it's really expensive to keep going to gigs, there's stuff on YouTube, there's stuff on, like, people share stuff on the internet. Just watch and read everything, especially the stuff you don't like because if you just stay within the bubble of things that you know you like, then you won't ever push yourself and you won't push your craft. So yeah, just read and write and learn and share and just enjoy it. Because if you're not enjoying it, there's no, really no point. Um, and yeah, and come say hi if you see me at a show and don't ever be intimidated to get up on stage and share stuff because that's, you know, poetry is the, Oral literature is the oldest form of like folk art form. Um, it's the way we share our stories. It's the way we, we know the world through stories and we recreate ourselves and our culture and our world through stories. And, um, and it's really important to keep doing that. And so if you're doing that, you're important. Keep doing it. Thank you so much. <laughs> it became a motivational <laughs> bit. Yeah, yeah. Right, poetry is really great. We end the, the whole <laughs> episode on that. Thank you so much. It was lovely talking to you. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Uh, we hope you, you enjoy uh, uh, the the interviews we managed to get from talking to some people. Yeah. And, uh, and tell us what you think in the in the comments and uh, on social media. You can share. Um, don't hesitate to listen to other episodes of ours. We have one about the Verve uh, Poetry Festival in Birmingham. Um, and yeah, thank you for watching. Um, yeah, you can now watch the podcast on Spotify. We have put some videos on there. So that's a new way of watching the podcast. You can watch it on YouTube. Uh, do subscribe to Substack because you get every episode in your inbox so you don't miss any. And that's the best way of supporting us is to be on that newsletter list. Uh, for us on every social that you are on and tag us and share it to your friends. Uh, people would be who people you think would be interested in it. And uh, yeah, spread the love because um, we love doing this podcast. So. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs>